so much for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a really fun workshop. I'm actually delighted with the exact number of people. We were talking about this before, and we want to go deep. And this is going to be a good number to go deep. Um, my name is Amanda Cassett. Um, I was the Chief Marketing Officer at Consensus for the past three and a half years. I have recently um, moved to focusing on blockchain and consumer projects and dApps because I think the next wave of adoption is going to come from building products on the blockchain that people actually use that solve problems. Uh, so that's what I'm laser focused on right now. But this presentation will definitely draw on my experience and the workshop hopefully will um, let us all kind of talk about how we tell our stories and optimize it and come together as a group to give each other feedback. Uh, but don't worry, they'll be made up stories and this will to be real stories. You won't have to share anything about your startup for yourself if you don't want to. Um, Riley, do you want to introduce yeah, yourself? Uh, I'm Riley, Riley Kim. I am the Asia Pacific PR for Consensus. I'm based out of Singapore, but I cover the Asia Pacific region. And uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to plug in with a vendor with a global view. Um, US centric, Europe centric, and then we get what it means for Asia moving ahead. And if you guys are interested in your stories for Asia, um, certain countries in Asia, what does that mean moving forward? So, we're going to kind of go through the history of the Ethereum narrative through the lens of the media East and West, um, the present stories that are on people's minds, and the opportunities to land certain kinds of narratives in the future. Then we're going to break into smaller groups and we're going to brainstorm pitches for the media. They don't have to be real pitches. They should be pitches for Ethereum startups or Ethereum or Ethereum projects. Then we're going to get back together as a group and we're going to pitch and we're going to workshop the pitches. Um, I think it'll be really valuable and if you have a project or an idea that you are looking to sharpen your pitch for, um, this will be a great moment to do that. First, can we get a sense of where people are from? Who here is from North America? So a lot of people. Who here is from Asia? Well, it'll still be interesting to go you, over. Europe or uh, rest of the world? Rest of the world? Uh, where where are you from? Paris, France. Oh, Paris. France. Okay. okay. Who, who has work? Who has project or work in Asia? Even if you're in Asia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Um, so, when we talk about Ethereum, who is listening to us? Um, the first thing when creating a narrative is thinking about your audience. Here are some facts about the audience for crypto and blockchain as it exists today. Um, Americans have heard of crypto. It's pretty saturated. 81% of Americans have heard of at least one type of cryptocurrency, according to a YouGov poll. Um, I believe that. Um, but Ethereum name recognition is lagging far behind Bitcoin. 75% of adults in the US have heard of Bitcoin, 24% Bitcoin Cash, which I don't believe, by the way, because I think they just answered Bitcoin yes and didn't think about Bitcoin Cash. So have to think about all these big founders. And, and, and actually what we're doing in this workshop is thinking about how people think rather than thinking about facts. So this is a workshop about perception, um, not necessarily a workshop about facts, although sometimes you have to create facts for real in order to create narratives that will work, um, or you know, usually. Uh, but um, So 24% Bitcoin Cash, which I think is actually more like 1%. Um, and 17% have heard of Ethereum. So that's a big gap between 75% and 17%. You get a 75 on a test versus a 17 on a test. Those are two really different options for you. Um, so then we tend to think about adoption, um, perception, narrative, so much in terms of the US market. But there, it, it, there are all these metrics by which Europe and Asia are outpacing the US even if the US and the English-speaking market is the one driving the global news cycle, which it mostly is. Um, so 41% of blockchain and crypto deals in Q2 2019 took place in Asia, 
34% in Europe and 28% in the US. With yes. What's the definition of the deal? Um, so I can send you the PwC report. So this is any kind of funding activity or an acquisition. So like a M&A or a venture funding. Um, so according to these metrics, the US amount of investment by several metrics is on the decline and, and compared in comparison to Asia and Europe. And I don't know whether that's always going to be true or whether that's incredibly significant, but to think that everything is about the US market just because the English speaking market is defining the news cycles just isn't true. Um, so the audience is truly global. I think if you asked um, people where they thought the densest adoption of crypto was, maybe they'd say like South Korea, maybe they would say the US, but they, they wouldn't say Turkey, Brazil, and Colombia, but those are technically the densest per capita adoption of crypto um, today. So who is the audience? So in, in, in my role at Consensus and on the marketing team, we spent a lot of time identifying who the people are that are searching for Ethereum, that are interested in the space, and these aren't all of them, right? There are a lot of different people. This doesn't have humanitarian organizations and NGOs on here. It doesn't have really small groups of people on here. These are just kind of the macro. Um, the biggest group is crypto buyers or potential buyers, and they're looking for market signals. They're looking at the price. They're trying to figure out what to do with their totalings. Uh, you have tech enthusiasts, so they're staying up to date on new trends in the industry. Maybe they're also researching machine learning, robotics, space travel. Maybe they follow Elon Musk and TechCrunch. Um, government officials are looking to form opinions on emerging technologies. Is this risky? How should my agency act um, regarding a new technology? Tech professionals, what kind of ways should I upskill myself? Uh, do I have a potential new job in a different kind of industry that I could get? Business decision makers. So that's at all different levels of, um, of an enterprise or of a startup. Is this a new way to make money? Could I make, could I make new kinds of partnerships? Could I integrate a new kind of technology that would, make, um, that would make my business more efficient or that would allow me to sell something new? Entrepreneurs, what kind of company should I start? What kind of company should I join? Um, startup investors, whether they're ready to enter the market or not, they're thinking about investment targets. And then news consumers end up hearing about Ethereum, blockchain, Bitcoin, if they just read top global news stories, but they only hear about it very rarely. So they just get these couple of little touch points. Um, so this is a reality check. Um, this, the, this little presentation is full of sort of real life stuff. And I know at DEF CON, we tend to be very um, idealistic and optimistic. And I am incredibly optimistic about Ethereum and about this space and about this community. But I think it's important to recognize most people searching for Ethereum care about price. Period. Full stop. And that's just true. It might not always be true, but it is true right now. And if you look at the numbers, um, they'll make you cry every time. <laughs> and if you didn't believe me, um, this Google search volume for Ethereum chart maps onto a certain set of activities in 2017, a uh, certain set of facts, and um, you can see that more people are looking for Ethereum during the moments when the price was in the news for being priced. Um, there were other news stories about Ethereum during that time, uh, but those were often connected to the fact that the price was increasing, which was driving other news covers. There's a flywheel, um, and so, I guess the point I'm trying to make with this is that the news coverage about the price increases genuinely brings more searchers into the space, even if you end up ca capturing those searchers and funneling them toward doing something else. So just because people come in for the price, it doesn't mean they'll stay for the price. Uh, you know, they might come in for, for something and you can convince them to be interested in something else. Maybe. We haven't yet. And then just to put this in perspective, so I think having perspective on all of this is really important. So this is Ethereum versus Bitcoin um, search volume. Remember that 75%, 17%, 75 on a test is a C, 17% uh, on a test is get out of town. Um, yeah, 
that's where we are. Um, so what have people heard about Ethereum so far? Um, well, mostly nothing, um, but that's an opportunity. Um, there's that story in marketing about the marketer who goes to represent the shoe company uh, and go ahead and send to a village where they're thinking of opening a shoe factory and the, the marketer reports back to his boss, they don't wear shoes here, so we can't work, open a shoe factory. But the other one says, we, they don't wear shoes here, let's start a shoe factory. So the fact that people haven't heard about Ethereum yet, or only 17% of Americans, is an incredible opportunity and a clean slate to educate people about Ethereum, which is amazing because sometimes we think of Ethereum or crypto in general as having a negative perception from all the different market cycles or from the ICO boom, but most people just have no perception at all. So it could be a good thing. Um, and this is a quote from Matt Leasing at Bloomberg. We interviewed a bunch of journalists creating this presentation, so we sort of reverse interviewed them to be able to present to you straight from the source what journalists are saying and what they want. Um, so Matt Leasing has been covering the space for years. Uh, since 2016, the same year I joined the space um, at Bloomberg. And he wrote, I'm not sure that, he, he said to me, I'm not sure the public knows about Ethereum at all. When I explain the book I'm writing, I always have to start with Bitcoin. And most people say, sure, I've heard of that. Ethereum is the next level beyond what Bitcoin can do. So there's nothing, there, there's, no, there's no narrative now for the vast majority of people that this is enormous opportunity. So here are the journalists that I interviewed, and then we'll go, go through the, uh, the ones from East, which, uh, which Riley interviewed, the East of our world. So Matt Leasing from Bloomberg, um, Laura Shin from Unchained, who used to work at Forbes, um, Bob Hackett from Fortune and Fortune's uh, spin-off, spin -off, that's an internal uh, publication that specifically covers crypto blockchain called The Ledger, and that's Bob Hackett. Josh Quitner, uh, who started Decrypt, and uh, Lee Kewen from Coindesk. And these are really different publications. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So Bloomberg is a business publication. So if you send, if you send Matt Leasing a pitch about a startup that's doing its first product launch, that's not the right thing. But if you pitch Matt Leasing about um, Microsoft uh, incorporating the Ethereum blockchain into 100% of its tooling. Yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a mad reason story. Laura Shin, she has a podcast, so she's not going to cover um, she's not going to cover like a single kind of daily news item scoop on a podcast. She's going to bring someone on to have a thoughtful conversation that takes a long time about an issue that's in the news these days. So it's going to be someone. So she'd have someone on speaking about DeFi as a concept, or speaking about Ethereum 2.0. But she probably wouldn't have uh, someone. She wouldn't cover the latest release of your of your DApp, even if it has a ton of users. Um, Bob Hackett would. He would love to cover a story about usage. And same with Josh Quitner from Decrypt. Uh, they both would cover, and, and so would Lee. Uh, all three of those would cover more of like a daily breaking news kind of story. Um, Decrypt also does deep dives. Um, and actually, all three of those sort of do deep dives. Um, I would say that Coindesk can be very critical. Um, it can also, I mean, it's also one of the best known industry publications about blockchain and crypto. Um, Decrypt tends to be more positive about blockchain and crypto startups. Um, but it has a pretty high barrier to entry to get coverage there. And then um, the ledger, same thing, because they're part of Fortune, they're a little bit more interested in the, the business side as opposed to like the culture and the community. They probably wouldn't cover like a, a, a Vitalik or a cat t-shirt. They wouldn't cover gossip from the community. They'd cover more like business news. Whereas Coindesk sometimes really covers gossip, um, which is interesting because they're all kind of, these are all, all, all really different publications. And, when you're thinking about telling your story to a publication, it's not like you have a fixed story and you just blast that out to everybody. You think about what they do and what they want, and you tailor how you communicate with them um, and how you tell your story to them based on what's actually up with them. Do you want to talk about the... Um... Yes, thank you. So for Asia, um, Asia is quite different. The media landscape is almost by definition um, in a different 
stage of maturity compared to the West, and by West is, is largely US and perhaps Eurocentric, so especially London, which speaks English. We come, which comes to the point of language. Um, one main thing that we really notice when, when, when reaching out to all of the, uh, in the region is it's quite fragmented, and part of it is because of language, and language is national. So if you look at someone from uh, Korea Times, basically they'll be interested in anyone, any stories that it has national alignment or national interest. Um, for instance, if uh, Samsung was going to do something, I wouldn't pitch that to um, Block Temple in Taipei. It has to land with the country. So their interest, as opposed to what Amanda mentioned, it, there are different players when you look at uh, media in the West, or international media, Bloomberg versus Decrypt versus Coindesk. Um, in Asia, it's largely still national. So if there are stories which are transnational, then perhaps you could go with some other than Bloomberg, which tends to have a regional view of how the Asia trends are. With these guys, however, with the crypto media, however, um, it has to land in their own backyard. So that is something we will come to. Because this, this ties back to language, and, and I'll take back to that. So I'm going to go through the um, widely known Ethereum story so far. And this is coming from the English speaking market, but it's global. Because a lot of what people read in, say, Japan is going to be from, let's say, Coindesk or Bloomberg. Um, and it's going to be translated over. But we're, we're, and then after that, we're going to go into how they specifically that the media coverage is different by region. So this is not the story of the most important things about Ethereum according to this community. These are, these are the things that passed some kind of activation threshold where a lot of people ended up knowing about them. And let's keep a lot of people in perspective because that's within the 17%. Um, so these are the things that registered in the global consciousness among that, among that 17%, which is probably lower globally, that's just for America. Um, and this is according to the journalists we spoke to. These were the ones that they all mentioned as kind of tentpole moments. So Bitcoin is emerging um, in 2009 as a niche. Um, really, the coverage as the price hits, as the price goes over $1,000. Then with Silicon Valley funding wallets and exchanges for Bitcoin, then the Silk Road scandal in 2011. And the Silk Road scandal and Bitcoin hitting over $1,000 blew open the Bitcoin space, but not even that blown open. Let's keep the 75% in perspective, too. Um, so the early days of Ethereum, the things that all of the journalists we talked to agreed registered was Vitalik's identity. So the fact that he was 19 years old really registered with people. His persona, his story, so you'll see in a lot of the initial coverage, this sort of whiz kid narrative. And it, uh, journalists are trying to tell stories about people because people tend to be interested in people, and stories about people tend to spread memetically a little bit more easily than stories about ideas. Um, okay, as a Bitcoin alternative, um, social good potential was covered a lot, and that's something that the kind of PR and marketing of the industry was successful at early on, telling the story that it was going to, to help people. And we can talk about how that maybe was a problem in a way in the end. Um, but talking about the social good potential, then the DAO hack, Right, so that was, um, I remember I was at a barbecue and I was with uh, this guy and he got a text from his mother saying, is this the thing you work on? <laughs> or was it grandmother? Grandmother. Grandmother, grandmother well. saying, is this, because it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, so, you know, this Ethereum thing got hacked. Uh, we're talking about perception, right? So we're only talking about perception. This is so frustrating for people that are deep in the community, this gap, but this is, this is what registered. Um, so then this rapid growth moment. In February of 2017, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance launches. Super significant because now you have these big corporates that are co-signing Ethereum in a way, saying this is something worthy of exploration, um, giving it some more legitimacy, because even though we have this young genius Vitalik story, it lacks that kind of gravitas cosine of some of these big names. Then we have the ICO boom, we're hearing about token fever, um, we have crypto kitties jamming up the Ethereum blockchain with, uh, with overuse, which highlights the need for scaling. And then we start having competition for L1, so you get a, a certain billboard in Times Square, uh, you get a lot of um, projects positioning themselves as Ethereum killers, which is actually just great for Ethereum on SEO. 
you know, kind of <laughs> of way. Um, so, yeah, so, so you, start, you start having that kind of narrative. In 2018, 2019, in a period that I'm generously terming recalibration, um, regulatory activity is getting started. So you hear about SEC enforcement, you hear about uh, CFTC, you get a market contraction. Uh, you get the rise of something called DeFi lately. Um, and you get some really interesting enterprise activity. You get Facebook, Libra, Calibra. You get JP Morgan coin. Um, you get Ernst & Young, which registered for adopting public blockchain. Um, so those, those are some examples of stories that registered. I think those are really the only stories that registered for most people um, that were within the 17%. Within the community, we know so much more than this. But these are these are what everybody that we talked to among the journalists agreed on, really kind of broke through. And this is just a reminder that sometimes stories don't do what you think they do. So this is from Bob Hack at a fortune. The Dow Hack gave Ethereum name recognition, kind of like any press is good press. It was an early test of Ethereum's resilience. And let me explain that a little bit. So you have Ethereum DAO hacked on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and you think, that is a bad negative word, so that's bad for Ethereum, right? Not necessarily, because the fact that someone hacked something means that there was something valuable there. So it seems like someone was trying to get something. The amount of money is a high amount of money, so it makes you pay attention. And there's this word Ethereum that's picking up SEO juice because it got that big front page story, which means Something else that Ethereum does is more likely to get covered because the journalists who are incentivized by trying to get traffic to their content are going to want to put Ethereum in a headline more than they did before. <coughs> Not that much, right? 17%, but more than they did before. So if you want to tell a positive story about Ethereum, you're going to have a higher chance of being able to tell a positive story about Ethereum after Ethereum DAO hacked. You see, does everybody does everybody get that? But it's in the moment. Especially if it's your project, you're like, oh my god, this is bad. And sometimes it is bad. Sometimes bad press is really bad press. But there are just all these nuances to it that are really important to think about, too. Um, so you'll notice that right now there are certain kinds of stories that are told a lot about uh, blockchain and crypto and Ethereum, and certain ones that we talk about in the community all the time that aren't. Why are some stories told and some stories not told? Told stories, funding, sales, acquisitions, token prices, regulatory actions, uh, prominent individuals, prominent companies, user numbers. Um, untold stories, the fact that we've been building this whole time with so much enthusiasm despite the market contractions, that's not a very widely known story. Uh, that, you know, at least in my opinion, uh, US regulators have taken a really thoughtful and nuanced position on Ethereum and Bitcoin. It's not like there's some big smackdown. It's actually been a, a really thoughtful conversation. Um, and then people associate all crypto with crime still because of Silk Road. Uh, and the best way to fund crime is still cash because it's truly an anonymous currency. <laughs> so the association of crime with all cryptos doesn't always make sense and comes from you know, just, just the types of media narratives that have broken through and formed kind of false associations. So what do these told stories have in common? And what do these untold stories have in common? So these told stories have um, properties that make for a headline that's going to get clicked on a lot um, and that's going to get shared a lot. So it, it, the names of prominent individuals and prominent companies can be put in a headline that's going to get the headline SEO juice or it's going to be clicked on more. Um, Regulatory actions, you know, someone cracking down, the SEC has a big SEO name, people always want to hear kind of the juicy gossip or you know, what went wrong. User numbers, that can be a really big positive. Um, people want numbers, people, uh, journalists love putting numbers in headlines. Like you know, numbers is such a, such a consistent uh, thing because they want to, journalists care about conveying the fact that they're really bringing you value and delivering information, and the fact that they can take a number and tell it to you is a way for them to be delivering value, and those stories tend to share more. Um, funding, sales, acquisitions, um, those are really concrete facts, and I think right now, 
journalists in the space are scared to talk about anything that's not super concrete uh, because there was so much um, uh, stuff that wasn't true that they got sold on a couple of years ago. Um, so what stories will we tell about Ethereum in the future? And this is just the global perspective. This is what our journalists say that they're looking for, that we spoke to. Um, so one theme that came up was the growth of DeFi, decentralized finance. So Lee Kewen said since the ICO boom, this concept of decentralized finance has really taken off. But Matt Leasing was skeptical. I don't even know what DeFi means. It feels very buzzwordy to me. I think it's just a paradigm that people are creating to escape from Bank of America. Um, so then prices and numbers matter. So Josh Quickner saying, we know our readers really care about the price, making Ethereum better, bigger, and more popular. And so real users, real problem solving, which gets back to the theme of numbers. Um, numbers or evidence of some sort is important. You need to explain the facts and statistics why. The other thing that helps the journalists understand is make sure they understand the problem and how the thing is going to solve the problem. A lot of times, she was saying, blockchain projects seem like they're solutions in search of problems. Um, and then people want to cover Ethereum 2.0 and the roadmap. The scaling of the technology and getting it to work, work well, will define whether or not we end up needing to talk about Ethereum L1 competitors. So unless, unless this scaling and 2.0 jam works out, from the lens of media and perception, that's going to define whether or not a bunch of other L1s become major topics of conversation. This is stuff that journalists say they probably won't cover right now. Um, so ideas or future plans without some kind of factual, grounded, or numerical hook. So this is something I overheard at a very little which just made me laugh. I've learned from covering this industry since 2017 to ignore the ideas and just focus on the money. Um, <laughs> So another one was, I love, I love Josh, Josh Butler. Everyone is hungry for bacon, not sizzle. Um, people don't want to cover another blockchain startup unless it's weird or different. Um, people don't want to cover yet another enterprise press release. Bob used to cover every press release he got of transitioning a backend process to a blockchain. Now it's so many releases that it's boring, so we won't do it. Um, and then, like we said before, people don't want to be pitched the wrong story for their outlet. And if you spam journalists with pitches that aren't right for them, they'll remember that forever and not cover you. Because <laughs> they just don't like being bothered with that stuff. You know, they get down with the ship. Let's move east. So I think just to kick things off, um, there's always this issue of Asia. But the problem is how do you define Asia itself? Right now we are in Asia, but if your first visit was to Japan, it's going to be very different if your first visit was to, let's say, Singapore, or Malaysia, or Thailand, or China, or even parts of China. And that's the sort of um, situation. It's a reality that we deal with, um, but we have to dissect it somehow. So if you look at the definition of, you often hear this toss around a lot, Asia Pacific, which has conventionally um, covered Australasia, Australia, which sort of covers the Pacific Ocean. The term itself, Pacific, comes from the Pacific Ocean. And I got these two charts. The one in the background is actually how the CIA will affect looks at Asia, which sort of touch on Russia via North Pacific. Um, now, in the past seven, eight years, we started to see the term Indo-Pacific um, comes up uh, via the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean. That has sort of a geopolitical um, hint to it because of um, how India but is coming up. Okay. Sorry, yeah. um, <laughs> so um, that's where the word in the Pacific, we may see more of it, but it really depends on how the joke like this nature plays out. Uh, we probably see the word East Asia quite frequently, and that um, translates to, generally speaking, Japan, Korea, China somehow, and then uh, Taiwan as well. And then there's the North and South Asian divide. North Asia generally, you know, China definitely in it. South Asia generally, India, Pakistan, that's out of space. And then Southeast Asia, Toss around a lot as well. These are some of the most dense, um, most culturally diverse. It is, I think, bilinguistically the most culturally diverse uh, place on Earth, Southeast Asia itself. And we have the ASEAN, the Dan Asia block. I didn't even touch on West Asia because that's really not in the imagination, generally speaking. West Asia um, sort of touched on, I would 
in say East Europe, but that space is kind of forgotten. Maybe that's an opportunity. We don't know, or we have to start from you know some point of departure. But the best way to approach, I feel, would be looking at the region as a whole um, via via two tracks: via the economy, the state of their economy, the state of how their market market is. Generally, we look at it via um, advance of developed nations and the ones that are still developing. And what does this mean for your story? Now, advanced economies tend to be the ones on this year. Um, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, China. It's I put a asterisk there because um, there are some a lot of qualification. It is largely still developing, um, but definitely, as we all know right now, a huge growing middle class. The common things with this nation is they are very familiar with uh, financial instruments. They already have records of savings. They know about trade. They know about debt. They know about credit cards. The question becomes, from an Ethereum, from a blockchain point of view, what's the catalyst for them? If they are in it for the trade, what's in it for them from a story point of view after just trading? If all they know is, you know, you know when they talk about Ethereum, when they talk about blockchain to them, if all they know is prices like what a vendor coined out, um, what's, what, what's in it for them after this? One thing we realized for these um, developed nations, when, we, when, when I speak with a lot of them, um, it's all about compatibility. Because this is a mature nation, by default, their infrastructure is really quite mature. If that is the case, where does your story come in? Where does your product come in? How do you come in? What sort of solutions are you bringing in? Are you being disruptive in a good way? Are you seen as disruptive in a bad way? This is um, inherent. We are in Japan right now. And I think this is something you guys might have experienced. Japan is a very interesting case across Asia because they are extremely, I would say, still culturally loyal to cash. Amazing convenience machine all over the country that you can use your coins, which I'm sure you have a lot by now. Um, it's really good. I really love their convenience ma uh, machine. One thing I ask, why is this? Why is there a you know, stickiness with cash? And I didn't think about it, but Japan is one of the safest places on, on, on the planet. You literally could lose your wallet with, I don't know, thousands of dollars, and then it will be returned to you, provided you have your ID card. That probably won't happen in a lot of other places. There is this trust element that is very inherent here, and it's something to think about when you think about the, the, the concept of trust, because that's inherent in, in, in blockchain and Ethereum as well. With South Korea, um, neighbors to, to, to Japan, a, a bit of tension going right now, but they focus much more on the ease of use. So again, when you think about the infrastructure they have, how are you going to be compatible with that? Singapore, where I'm from. So uh, post-war rapid growth, um, we are seeing a bit of a generation gap uh, because the nation has really grown in the three decades to become first world. Um, there is a gap between the, what we call the elder generation who are not that familiar with the internet. How do we get them on board? If your product is going to really serve the masses as some products claim to be, how do you reach them? We have to talk about that. China is the one I put an asterisk. Um, you must have heard of WeChat by now, TikTok. These are China products, uh, Chinese products. And they are miles ahead from that point of view due to near universal adoption. Just as a fun fact, the government of Singapore is actually very impressed by how China has gotten pretty much cashless. It's something that the Singapore government is trying to catch up without leaving people behind. On to the developing nations. Uh, these are the ones that we kind of more or less um, define them as. Most of them are in the Southeast Asia region, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, to the largest market. Vietnam has somewhat become the new China because of uh, it's becoming the, the place to go for manufacturing. As, as labor cost rises in China, production is moved to, to, to Vietnam. Thailand is coming, becoming more interesting for blockchain. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. Malaysia, Myanmar, and then um, for that, as opposed to the previous slide where, where, where we talk about combat in the country. When we talk about um, this, this developing market, for blockchain, we often talk about the word financial inclusion. Uh, you have to remember for, for, for this market, financial inclusion really matters because a large portion of, of the guys who are unbanked, what we often say, are underserved. They don't have ID, they don't have a bank account. This is what really matters to them. You know, in some people, I wouldn't say it's life and death, but it, it makes a huge impact on their communities. And from that, you can tell you to um, what the government think of in terms of why do we want blockchain in our backyard? Because it helps with education, it helps with upskilling them, and it brings them up to speed with the rest of the developed nation. So this is the sort of point that is really important here. I, I will harp on this a little bit more because when we talk about financial inclusion, does it matter to me if I'm a Japanese citizen with a rate of five credit cards? I don't really need financial inclusion, but if I'm in the Philippines, 
I'm in the rural island, I work with a community bank that isn't plugged into the system, I need that. Do you have in the developing markets, somewhat American naive question, but do you have like cell phone model and coverage? Yes. So broadly speaking, I would say um, in well, it depends though. We will still uh, again, it's so diverse. It depends on where you are. But as a as, as a broad stroke, um, most of the developing markets they will have more cell phones than uh, bank and IEs. So that's the opportunity to come in from you know internet connectivity. And there's a certain level of smartphone that's the dominant. Uh, Android cheaper. Right, but like at what level? At what a penetration level. I have to get the stats for you, um, but I would believe, okay, it, it differs by country, but um, just offhand, it would probably be 70, 70 to 80 percent versus the actual number of users who don't have um, you know, a banking account. That, that disparate figures, I can get it for you then, definitely, but it's very, very clear. Um, so again, we come back to infrastructure. So for this country itself, it's all about the opportunities to plug the gaps uh, in their largest just some general statistics. Indonesia is an interesting one. They have sort of always been, Indonesia and Philippines have always been the go-to market to test for um, countries that are starting up shop in Southeast Asia when they want to roll out um, startups. So for instance, partly it's because there is so much gaps in the infrastructure. So if your product can be compatible, can provide a good service, the adoption is actually very swift. Uh, Grab itself effectively displaced Uber out of the space. So that's how fast the adoption can be. Philippines is something, um, I can talk a little bit more, but maybe not right now. Uh, Project I2I is something that consensus work on with the Union Bank of Philippines. The, I would say the thesis behind it is financial inclusion. Philippines is one of the nations that has um, about 10% of the GDP come from remittance. And if they rely on the existing service of you know, uh, paying up to 7, 7 to 10% of the of um, fee on remittance, that's really not something that's helpful for them. If you are able to bring it down to you know five uh, percent or even lower than that, that's the impact we're trying to create. So if you Google Union Bank I do I, you actually see a lot of hits, and we're very happy about that. Thailand. So this is the one that's sort of interesting. We haven't really had a lot of taps on that, but you would um, again if you Google it, you see a lot of new legislation coming up just this month. So, so I would sort of look at it from this dual track. To, 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 you know, to, to tackle the issue itself. Where are you and what's the problem you're trying to solve and what are the roadblocks that you come across? Now, um, I can't cover the whole of Asia. That's impossible. <laughs> it's about 4.6 billion. But we're going to just focus a bit more on East Asia by definition that we are here in Japan. Um, I'm going to touch on Japan really quickly. So right now it's an exciting place to be. So next year, obviously, um, Summer Olympics is here. Earlier this year, uh, the G20 summit was held in Osaka as well. They talk about the Japan Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He talked about um, digital trust, the digital uh, trust economy. They expect really a lot of things to come up from the digital economy. As a country itself, Japan has somewhat been interesting because you know post war is really successful. Household names uh, Sony to Panasonic. Um, they have sort of fallen behind a little bit, including culturally where K K pop has really taken over the stage. So they are aware of this. The banking system in Japan is very aggressively looking at exporting, partly because of the demographics in, 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 in Japan, like most other developed nations, it's aging. They need um, to look. They need to look globally. So you have to think of that when you are thinking of um, if a product is something that does with financial services in Japan. How does that come into play? Uh, sorry, you have to get some two of the matches that are cancelled tomorrow. By the way, um, on to South Korea. Just as a fun fact for, for, for web things, are, if you are familiar with the boy band um, BTS, I'm not, but apparently they account for 4.65 billion of the country's GDP. <laughs> just, just, just so you know how impactful South Korea is. So if your startup is a boy band? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> really boy band or ETU? Um, <laughs> again, just to give you a bit of context, that puts them in the space of Samsung and, and, and Hyundai. That's a sort of a place where Korea is right now. So when we look at when I look at some of the statistics when we work um, you know, from consensus of us, um, we get a lot of hits from Korea. We get we get a lot of news every other week, every other day. We see something coming out of um, South Korea, a new development, um, sort of a new startup, and it's an exciting place to be on. Uh, now onto China, which as a region is a bit trickier. I label it um, by language instead. Greater China, the Mandarin speaking region. Obviously, that's mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, to some degree, um, Singapore by linguistic heritage. So this space itself is, uh, is a bit different. Let's start with mainland China itself. I mentioned earlier with WeChat. Um, with China, I think, um, actually, I think I have to put a slide here. Sorry. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll, I'll do this in three. So, um, so for this was actually a photo I took when I just came in from uh, Seoul to Tokyo at a shop I wanted to have udon. They didn't take uh, my credit card. It was a good thing I have cash though. It wasn't very expensive, but that's when I started asking around and I found out that it's, it's just a cultural thing because it's such a safe nation. If you lose your wallet, you will get it. Earlier on, the manga showed a good, a very good slide about the DAO hack. I asked around about the DAO and the mount box. Apparently, it wasn't really a thing. It's back in the news again just by location, but it's actually not in the public imagination, I would say. Um, the other interesting thing that we mentioned, uh, that, that I mentioned about Tokyo 2020, uh, uh, let me see if there's anything else on the cover. Rakuten wallet line. Okay, I think we're good here. For Korea, yeah. What I mentioned, uh, less sticky with cash. As opposed to Japan, which emphasizes quality of service, Japan is very, um, I would say, culturally, perfection is important to them. So I think from a blockchain point of view, you know blockchain has to be you know, smart contract audits. So in Japan, the tolerance level for errors is very low. So you have to think about that. In Korea, it's a bit different. They are, they are, they are much more concerned with um, efficiency. Less sticky with cash. Uh, this code itself, um, why do I have to unlock the app key in my pin versus just swapping my card came from the journalist at Korea Times when we were talking about it. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Again, if I'm already in the developer nation, I have a number of credit cards, I have a, you know, if I use an iPhone, I have uh, digital credit cards itself. What makes, what, what makes it compelling for me to not use that and use some sort of you know, blockchain enabled payment system if I have to unlock it, key in my pin? Um, we all talk about the inability to remember your, your, your the child faces. So this is something to think about, again, if you're looking at something from a consumer point of view. Um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Chibos. That's the family, traditionally family-run conglomerate. So the, 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 and I would say the economy is largely driven by this, this, um, this culture of uh, conglomerates, the Samsung, the LG, the Hyundai's. Um, for them, these are largely conservative, traditional, family-owned businesses. They wouldn't be as risky as a lot of other uh, countries, uh, a lot of other companies in other countries. So that's where we start to see a culture of them promoting and partnering startups. What this means is they may not want to actually do it themselves. They are happy to fund or find partners to, to fund, and it's something that, that they can partner with. Uh, Clayton, I think I pronounced it correctly. Clayton is something that came out of Kakao. Kakao is basically the platform, the way that China has WeChat. Kakao Talk is the platform for South Korea. Um, obviously, you have Line, you have you have Telegram, but Kakao is basically it. So this is one way that a big company like Kakao comes on board, not directly in their department. Perhaps it's a you know um, brand and risk management profile, but it's just something to think about if you are going to work with these companies. And to some extent, if you can partner one, it probably gives you a lot of knowledge because they will have um, mass capacity. Uh, again, a lot of news around the existing financial system. We've seen a lot of news from Samsung, Hana Bank, LG itself. And again, um, onto the Chinese speaking geographies. I want to go there by a specific region. Uh, for China, let's do that first. China in itself is, um, you know, I don't know, whether, I don't know where to begin. That's why I, I spoke to a few journalists. And we can look at it by theory. The first tier, uh, the first tier cities, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Shenzhen. And then the second one with Nanjing, Xiaowen. Chengdu is the one that has a lot of mining because of um, uh, geothermal energy. But I would say with China, it's a tricky one for Ethereum. Partly because um, I'm sure you guys would have heard the 2017 ICO ban. Uh, and when the Chinese government does something, the Chinese government does something. And effectively, what it happened for, for uh, what happened previously, Ethereum was pretty much known as a, as a good education platform. So universities, government was exploring it. But when the ban happened, they sort of played conservative. They didn't want to talk about Ethereum. It became an opportunity for hyperledger fabric. So universities, uh, governments are actually more experimenting on it. Uh, just as a, you know, as a fun fact, we did a hackathon in the country, um, representing another uh, country, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't go to the media. They were surprised to see the number of people using um, Ethereum. Uh, so, uh, what I meant was the developers in China at a hackathon, they was about 90%, 90% I, I believe, did it on Ethereum, and the local uh, representative was a bit surprised because of how pervasive the, com the, the, the conversation around fabric is for the business side of things. So I, I think this is something we want to be aware of representing the Ethereum community. Um, I asked about what's, what's for them moving ahead. Uh, 
the conversation that Amanda mentioned, DeFi, from the development's point of view, yes, they see the wider financial uh, world itself. The media, however, they are sticky about price itself. Again, so this is something you have to deal with this. We, we, we have to look at it from that as well as where um, we are. If the ICO bank doesn't move and the conversation is still around hyperledger fabric for enterprise, where do you come in when you represent Ethereum? Uh, with Taiwan, however, it's a bit different. Although linguistically, obviously, there's a lot of exchange, the Ethereum scene is actually very lively. And I understand part of it is the, the, the job. Kudos to the foundation. Uh, Vitalik has been very active there. What Amanda mentioned earlier, in this, I would say about 2015, 2016, Vitalik probably is still seen as a prodigy there. Um, everywhere, I guess, in Singapore as well, yeah. So when we talk about blockchain, they tend to equate it with Ethereum. That's good. It's actually over Bitcoin. So when you talk to the developers, they equate it quite strongly with Ethereum. Uh, most of them, most of the developers, they are pretty familiar with uh, you know, um, the, 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 the programming, the smart contract. Um, when I ask a little bit more, I get a sense that everyone knows it, but no one knows the depth of it. They know it at the superficial level, smart contract. Everyone can, can, can say that. What's beyond that? Uh, sharding, slack chain. That's something that's a, a gap itself. We, we see that as a gap. Uh, something that you guys should know as well. So when I look at it, when, when I ask the question, what, what about moving ahead? What are the stories you see? Um, they are starting to say uh, there is a sense of, um, I guess, to put it frankly, impatient. They are waiting for 2.0 and they want to see what's going to happen. Uh, when, when, when EOS went, went live, they obviously will be curious to experiment. They are all basically asking, we are really familiar with a smart contract. What is next? They are waiting for 2.0, is, is, is what I'm saying. For Hong Kong and Singapore, um, financial trading hub, for them, the main thing I would say is uh, largely similar to Japan and Korea, already very developed, uh, you know, credit cards are bound, uh, people are familiar with trading. Uh, digital banking is something that's fairly new in, in, in these two markets. So earlier this year in Hong Kong and in Singapore, the central bank announced that they will be issuing what we call internet or digital only banks. Uh, in some region we call them new banks. It's something that I believe is very new in these two markets. The idea is that this would, um, digital banks will be able to challenge traditional financial banking. So the interesting thing for them is you don't have to come from, your genesis doesn't have to be a bank to apply for this license. Uh, you could be Uber for instance, you could be a telco. And it's interesting because Uber telcos by default, they already have a large following. And they're forcing the traditional banks to basically make changes. Uh, this leads to the question, where will Ethereum be when we talk about the future of money for financial trading hubs? Uh, we already have, we already have um, TransferWise, Revolu, uh, Pay Now, Pay Live, something that's big in Singapore and across um, the Southeast Asian market as well. So these are certain pillars you should think about if you're tackling this market. This is something I, I won't really call it country, uh, but really by, by, by the fact that they share a common language, largely. I sort of covered the three main uh, regions I, I, I want to cover for East Asia, and I also want to sort of, I guess, bring it back to where Amanda started. Now, when we talk about Asia, when we talk about stories itself, it's very linguistic focus, it's very national focus. Um, and the reason I'm brought on by Amanda, and thank you so much, um, was when we were thinking about this topic itself, when we look at it, we all speak English, but what about readers who are based in Japan or Korea, and they, are, they could only, let's say, contact with their own language? What would they be reading? Obviously, content from, you know, um, uh, Coindesk, which I believe June is here, on Coindesk will be translated and it gets picked up. But what happens to content that's truly local? If I want to represent the Korean market, if I'm a journalist, I, I, I'm hungry for Korean only stories, where do I begin? And where, where, where are your opportunities? Um, early on, Amanda had a good slide that talked about the tempo moments. Again, when I asked about it, Mao Gok's Dao really wasn't in the public. Even now, when I ask the uh, editor at D Street, um, they are a crypto media in, in Korea, he was showing me how things rank. It, it's basically all it, um, Ethereum 2.0, Vitalik, DAO isn't even up in the top five. This is what he, he, this is what he told me. I, I, I can't be sure, you know, I don't speak Korean. Um, however, I would still say the influence of where news come from you know, uh, in the US is still interesting because when I think about what happened in Asia, when the Ethereum pop into our public imagination, um, this three years, 2016, 2017, 2018, we all know what about uh, 2017 and 2018. So 2016, um, two things happened on the global stage that affected how Ethereum was covered and how blockchain was covered in, in, in parts of Asia. Um, these two things are, do you want to make a guess what these two things are in, in 2016? 
not quite, that's more 2017. So 2016, two things that happened wasn't really Asia itself. Um, it was the Brexit vote, and it was the presidential election that got struck. So what happened was when this two thing happened, um, immediately the prices of cryptocurrency spiked a little bit. And then from there you have the conversation that it, 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 it became a crypto assets basically a safe harbor and all, an alternative. That is, sort of, that is the moment when Asia started to look at prices itself. And when, that's the moment when people started to look at Ethereum, blockchain, Bitcoin. So that happened in 2016. So it's good to know that we want local stories in Asia, but it's also good to know that there is still some form of entanglement with the global stage. And that's something that is, yeah. And that that story didn't really register in the English speaking market. Like, nobody was thinking, like, very few people were thinking that there might have been one or two stories about it, but that's not what was capturing attention. So that's like, Good, yeah, it, 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 it was an interesting disconnect that we found really interesting. Like, um, Amanda was telling me again, Mao Gox Dao. That totally didn't land well, but instead it was Brexit, it was Trump, and then they started to associate the prices. And then for 2017, ICO. 2018, again, the price discussion. But now in 2019, um, I, I think what Amanda mentioned about recalibration has a lot of. Uh, it's, it's pretty legit. The conversation in Asia is now part, pretty much into the enterprise side of things. Um, I think moving ahead, we ask the question, you know, uh, what's the next narrative for Ethereum? For Asia, what's the next narrative? We, um, I've explained how the regional blocks work, the dual economies, and the question that we need back to you, is there a narrative for Asia? Is there a single narrative for Asia? Is there a single narrative for Korea, Japan, or Southeast Asia, if, if, if that's a space you want to go after? What do, the, what do the media need? What kind of stories are you putting out? Um, that, that, that wonderful quote, Bacon and Caesar. So I, I, I think these are the kind of a conversation we want to uh, kickstart in this workshop. What are we innovating and who are you impacting? Um, I, uh, that, I, th I think that's it from my end. Great. So now it's time for us to practice making some sizzle. And it should be the kind of sizzle that makes it really seem like there's bacon. Um, does, that, does that land with everyone? <laughs> okay, good. Laugh with you if that land with <laughs> okay, great. Well, we're gonna um, we're gonna split into groups, and we have some real journalists here, which is which is great, and some people that are very practiced at um, speaking to press and representing different projects. We're going, you guys are scared of breaking into little. It's a workshop. It's a workshop. It's a workshop, man. All right, all right. Well, we're gonna have one big group. So I was thinking, maybe if we, that, that seems like a reaction, that seems like a market reaction that people don't want to bring into small groups and do this exercise. Is that true? No. Yeah, probably. I think it is. Do yeah. people, who wants to break into groups and do this exercise? Who wants to do, you want to break into groups and do that? Who, who does not want to do that? Who has like questions that? as well? Yeah. Oh, maybe we should do questions first. Yeah. You want to do questions first? <laughs> Great, let's do questions first. I had a question back to like, I'm sorry, did you? Oh, slide one. Um, you don't have to go back to it. I think you said that. Uh, oh gosh, now I forgot my question. Oh, um, <laughs> there's more growth outside of the U.S. Do you feel that's attributed to regulatory culture in the U.S. or? Yeah, that was a stat from a PwC report from one quarter, and the point of my including it was that even though the, so much of the global narrative around crypto and blockchain is shaped by the English-speaking market. Um, not all, but some. The act, not all, but that isn't actually dominant in terms of where all of the activity is happening. And there's so much activity in Asia and Europe, even though they're not the ones setting the story, oftentimes. So that was kind of the point of my including that. Not to say, not so much to say that like Why? the U.S. is not interested. It's almost to say that these these other areas are increasingly interested. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, great talk. I've lived throughout Southeast Asia, China, and Africa. Um, the U.S. is only a quarter of, maybe a quarter of the market of what's happening. And I think it's because the population of the United States is 350 million as opposed to the rest of the population around the world. So that's probably why there's a lot more interest and activity outside the United States. But um, a lot of uh, what we're seeing is, uh, what I'm seeing outside the United States is a lot of the thought process is being driven by the United States, even though it doesn't even make up a quarter of what is happening in the rest of the world. So how do you, how do you include and, and 
how do you from a because both of you are from two different continents and two different uh, sides of the, the planet, how do you guys collaborate and how do you include and how do you get that message out as a singular message to the rest of the um, economies and the rest of the activity and, and, and how do you make sure that when you do report um, on a subject matter that you're taking in the perspective of many different economies and many different perspectives and many different countries and report as a as a, a one unit of information that everybody can understand and apply in their ecosystem. I'm going to tell you two mini stories that point to the necessary to look necessity of localizing messages. And the first is that if you translate the word decentralized literally into Japanese, it means soulless. And if you think about that, that makes sense, you know? It's like, in a metaphorical way, it's like your like soul thing is all over the place, and it seems like maybe it's split apart into little shards, and uh, you know, that, that also makes sense. And the word, the word I, I think, I don't know what this actually the theory, theory about decentralization, but it was one of, one of our core key terms, is very close in Mandarin to the word revenge. Uh, and actually, we were, we were working on, it, it, was in, um, no, it was in Korean, it was in Korean. We were localized, I was working with the EF helping to localize the ethereum.org website, and we, we, we had, um, we did like an algorithmic sweep, and then we had a human sweep, and the human sweep was like, oh my goodness, every time this thing says blockchain, it said it means revenge. It, it was wild, it was really interesting. Um, so this is, that, that's exactly, so, I mean, after living in, in China and learning how Starbucks went into, moved into China, Xingba Ke, they had to think of each of the characters, or Kentucky Fried Chicken, Kentucky, or McDonald's, McDonald's, you know, they had to have a, com like a common um, thread to the name to advertise who they are, but they had to have it communicated inside that community and that ecosystem and that country and that language from that perspective. What's so everybody kind of got it. So how do you, and that's, Exactly, the soulless uh, point is what I'm thinking about and the different languages being applied to the messages. Well, it's not even about just the words in different languages. The word, the words and languages, if you kind of believe the saber work hypothesis, emerge from like a system of thinking mm -hmm. that's embodied by a language. And so it's not just about realizing that the thing you auto-translated something into Japanese yeah, makes it exactly. seem like your soul exploded. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's about really thinking about the Japanese narratives around some, like the concept of something being decentralized. It's about like having a very rigid hierarchical business culture here, the way that they do, and how to explain that to them. And that might be different. If you have a company, like, like Consensus, let's say it has a project, and you're going to explain that project a little bit differently in different markets, while still being accurate about the nature of the project. So, uh, Jim. Oh, I just had a question. Uh, oh, so, so, and you emphasize different things um, that you feel like are going to resonate the most with different markets, and that's why you have a team that has folks that are able to localize different <coughs> markets, not just literally translate them, but genuinely localize them based on yeah. a real understanding of what people in that market care about. So, sorry, just, just, just really quickly, so because my role is, uh, I cover Asia Pacific, so this is something, and most specifically Asia, for Pacific is really Australia, and Australia, it's English, basically. Um, so I don't have to worry that much with that. For Asia, I speak Chinese, but um, I, I don't speak Korean or Japanese. Do you speak Mandarin or Cantonese? Uh, Mandarin, I understand Cantonese. Okay. Um, the tricky thing is, e e even that is a bit tricky, because Cantonese is totally different. It uses a Chinese script, but it's told, there are words that doesn't expand. Yeah, so we've sort of, um, it's a learning process, but uh, I, I think to, 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 to sort of answer your question, it's both. It's, a, it's a, what we call, you know, this term is tossed around a lot by HSBC like 28 years ago. Global, global, local. Right. But it's true, because when I put out certain announcement from the you know, um, state side, um, and, I just, and, and we sort of distribute that amongst the different uh, offices in the region, we find out very interesting things. Like we had a piece of news um, about Kaleido, which is the business club itself. Japan, for some reason, um, our Japan colleague told me that is something that was really interesting. Um, then we had something else that, that came up, and another country told us this is something we want. The translation, however, is something that 
um, we get local partners, we get external, and then the local office, they, they do that. Because you need that, that level. It, it comes back to a point, um, my half the presentation is basically emphasized that the local media represents the local readers. They are your audience. Ultimately, they are your consumer audience. So they need to understand the word. So if they're reading a if they're reading a blog or something, or they read something in, you know, on a website, on your website in English, they hit Google Translate, they're going to see the word slowness. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's something you want. Yeah. Um, so I guess it depends on, from, from my point of view, it depends on how you're going to plan your you know, plan of attack, your resourcing, and to make sure you have the proper representation, uh, the, com the, 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 the proper community. Um, decades ago, from a marketing point of view, it was easy for companies to make a lot of mistakes, the one that you mentioned. Um, and it's not just Asia, when they translate certain brand names into you know, France or you know, oh, Spanish. I, I, I live in Nigeria. Of in classic marketing. I lived in Nigeria and there was a air conditioning company, Tire, that moved into Nigeria and they wanted to dominate the market for air conditioners, but they didn't understand the local pigeon. And when you say, I didn't know go, I know go now, I, it means that I am going. And so this one of the marketing guys came in and he said, I'm going to put a billboard up and it's going to be an air conditioner and it's going to say, we know cool, which means we do not cool in the local language. But he wrote K-N-O-W, not N-O. So we know cool and there's a lot of a high level of literacy in the area. So if somebody says, hey, what does that say? It says we know cool and has the air conditioner there. They're going to understand that, that air conditioner does not cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that man did not last in that job for very long. And this is the reason why I came to hear you guys talk because um, understanding and communicating <laughs> Ethereum in the local language and the local ecosystems and how it translates is so important. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really finding out, um, the language is a given, I feel, you, you really have to commit to, you really have to put in resources and commit to um, getting it translated accurately. Right. And the challenge is because our space is so new, blockchain is so young, Ethereum is so young, a lot of the words are new, DeFi, that came out nowhere, didn't it? And then now it exists as a concept, as a philosophy, as, as a, as a, as a uh, and, and how do you translate that into Korean, Japanese? And if you are going to the market, you know, if you go to the Myanmar, the language is going to be different. I have no idea what that translation would be, but you have to sort of do your homework, I feel, um, to do. Because this is so new, it's not a, we are not in an established space where we're selling paper and chair, the words are already established, the lexicon is there. The lexicon is, is still evolving for us. You know, next week we may have a totally new lexicon. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, sorry, Joe, you wanted to? Oh, no, I just had a question. So for you, you guys as uh, communications practitioners, uh, what, what do you see as the key uh, platforms, uh, or titles, or maybe journalists, or social media channels? What are, what are the key levers that you guys pull to get your message out? I think it's completely dependent on the message and the goal. So, I mean, I, I think if you start with, I want to, if you start with, I want everyone to know what I'm doing and who I am, and this is the story. That had, that's a very limited way to start. I think you have to work backward from, I want to take my product to Japan, and, and I want to get this amount of users in Japan, and here are the media outlets in Japan, and here are the things that they cover, here are the things that they don't cover, here's what bothers them, here's what they like. So I'm going to craft a story for my project, working backward based on where you want to place it. So it, it's never communication in a vacuum. It's always communication based on target audience. Um, I would say that communications is a protocol or a practice rather than a set of stories or any sort of, don't you agree with this, right? Like any, any specific like piece of content. It, it's, it's, a, um, it's a way of behaving. It's, a, it's an intellectual exercise of connecting the landing point with the existing entity or project um, while, while, while being representative of, of the thing. Um, does that make sense? So, so a lot of crypto projects want to land, a, a lot of crypto projects, I would say your standard issue thing um, is looking for, um, uh, they're often looking for numbers, adoption numbers. 
um, if, if the thing you really care about is just high numbers of users, Indonesia, as Riley mentioned, is a great place to experiment and just get users. This cost of user acquisition is really low. But the spending power of your average user is really, really low too. So that's a great place to optimize your product and your marketing campaign and then take it into, there's some other places like that too, and then take it into a higher price point market. But then you might have to have two different price points. One for the folks in Indonesia that can't afford it once they move into, so you have to be thoughtful about it. Um, and you have to be respectful about it, otherwise you're gonna have a negative brand back backlash. So let's say we've gotten a bunch of users in Indonesia. Now we're back advertising in the US. Um, a lot of a lot of companies want to have some. If they're going if they're going for adoption in the crypto community, they want CoinDesk, they want Coin Telegraph. If they're doing a product launch, they'll want it on TechCrunch. Um, that they might be able to get something into like Fortune's The Ledger, um, decrypt the block. Um, there's a, there's a whole cadre, um, and then. You know, usually startup founders in the space don't understand that they're going to only get niche coverage or like industry coverage first, for, first, um, <laughs> first, um, because usually like the way that we talk to each other in this space is often a little bit grandiose. Um, you know, you know, change my thing is changing the world. Why is this not the front page news? The New York Times. You know, and. Um, and, and, and you lose track of what other people are thinking about and what other people's incentives are. Um, and, and also how much technical knowledge people really have, especially when you're getting outside the industry media. And so that's why I put this quote from Matt Lee saying at Bloomberg on here, which is, don't dumb it down, but think of a color, colorful way to get your message across. So work on explaining in plain English what you're doing. And then maybe you can land some national stuff. So like FT is a great place to land a finance story. New York Times. Um, Nat Popper is a really hard guy to get a hold of, um, but you can if it's really, really, really important. Um, I hope you're watching this. <laughs> Email me back. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, Matt Leasing, has, it has to be a really high barrier to entry thing. Paul Vigna at the Wall Street Journal. Um, Ola Harif at Bloomberg also. Olga, um, uh, who else are people really wanting to get in front of? Um, some Reuters people can get in front of. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are like the those ones that everyone, ones, those yeah. are the juicy ones that everybody wants. And then, I mean, so Forbes, back when you were, just to, just to make it really personal, when, when you were reporting for Forbes, I, I had, I had courts like, very much in that list in my mind, but I haven't. I don't think I've seen as much from them covering the space since you went to point us. But um, Aaron, I don't know his last name. Aaron. Aaron something at quotes. Uh, maybe Matt. Matt is on the Yeah, Matt is. He was. Matt. Yeah, I know. and Forbes. Forbes. I mean, Michael Delcasti is there now. Um, Forbes and like their that gave them a reputation. Yeah, those are the people. Those are the people that people want to land with. Uh, and then Twitter. Every every startup cares so much about their Twitter because the space has so much crypto Twitter. Uh, Discord. People are having Discords now. Um, what's what's the list of those people in for Asian markets? Asia is quite different. By languages, is is quite different. Um, for media itself, is tricky because the, what we consider the, the 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 top tier, top tier, the the Google, they are very hard to land. Um, by default, the market in Asia are very focused on enterprise and numbers, facts and figures. Um, earlier on, I, I mentioned to hit you know, Korea time, to hit Choi San, uh, which is Korea. Um, Korea. Uh, they focus on stories related to Korea. If you are doing something in Samsung that helps, or with Samsung, let's say, that uh, impacts a certain community group, you know, um, you're doing something that helps elderly in So That's a Korean story. It's it, does, it just makes no sense for me to push it to you know, Japan, uh, unless there was a relation. Now with uh, the Bloomberg, the Reuters, Reuters they have national desks. Um, with Bloomberg, CNBC, they tend to be a bit more regional. They like regional stories, um, highly competitive. If CNBC what, takes a story, Bloomberg may not. You know, like the first exclusive, this is, this is not new. Um, onto the social platform, that's a bit tricky because it's extremely diverse. Uh, WeChat, like I mentioned, that is the dominant platform for China and it sort of covers in New Hong Kong as well. Uh, you literally don't have to get out of WeChat app to, do, to live your life in China. Everything is you know, it's one place. Um, it doesn't mean that you want your stories to go on WeChat. 
So I think uh, you might have heard of Jinsa Golden, uh, which means I think Golden Color Finance. They, if I'm right, they got booted off WeChat because they were seen as too, like, too, doing too many paid uh, commentary, and that affected their, mark, their numbers immediately. So um, WeChat, obviously, in parts of Asia, line, line under uh, Naver Group, that is big as well. Uh, Facebook, in parts of the developing market, social media, it, it's interesting, in parts of the, and it's something that you know, we, we talk about, Joe Lubin talk about, um, in parts of Asia, social media equals internet. You wouldn't think of it that way. I mean, you would still go to Google in, in, in the morning, or you, know, you go to FT, you go to Yahoo or something, not sure about Yahoo, but you, you do that. In parts of the developing market, social media is the internet, is how they get information. That's why there's so much concern with uh, you know, um, Facebook and fake news, uh, Facebook um, accepting ads that may have a hidden agenda, you know, things like this. That's, that's, the, that's the challenge that um, Facebook is facing and any other social media platform, but Facebook is de facto, so you know, um, uh, what, I forgot the word for it, but uh, very unpleasant news in, in um, I forgot, actually for, um, I forgot the word, but th th this is the case with um, developed market, so line, line is because in, in, in Thailand as well. So for instance, if we were to get a piece of news in um, Bangkok Post, which is the sort of like national English language in uh, Thailand, that's a huge hit. That's a huge hit if you want your channel to read it because it's in English. But if you want a local local consumer to read it, he or she is, isn't going to read the back of books. He or she is, is, is going to see what's online, what's on Facebook. So that's a sort of um, you know, uh, it sounds expensive now if you have to split everything. But you have to like what Amanda mentioned: who's your target audience? What is the goal? What is and then you move backward. What becomes the the the, the, the channel? So what, just just to add, add like add some more. This might even be slightly disturbing, but so so the way that we organize the PR team at Consensus is that we have Asia and US Europe represented in house, and then we use external firms all over the world to get more reach. So we're coordinating with internal full time folks with external agencies. So we were we were interviewing. We were thinking about having a PR agency in um, in South Africa, and we were interviewing these PR agencies, and um, they kept on sending me decks for content. And I didn't understand. I didn't understand why in all of their SOWs, if content creators like we have, we have a content team, just PR, like just 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 talk to the journalists and localize the message for the journalists there. And the, and I, I, it was so confusing that they explained to me there's no difference. The PR writes every story and then they publish it. And there's no there's no like they were so confused. I did not know this. That that, I, that, I, that there's this. They're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what? So there's a different thing going on with just like what media is and how it works in different markets. And so assuming that everything about, about narrative construction works in the same way around the world. And I actually do think that part's pretty fairly similar between um, Asia and uh, US and Europe, but it's not necessarily true everywhere. Well, I think I mean I think that's a really interesting point. Like where you have a dominance of cell phones, you're going to have a dominance of media through things like WeChat, Line, and Facebook, and that then allows you or gives you an opportunity to do your own PR as news, right? And also to use um, influencers right in those yeah. communities who have big audiences. Yeah. Like what you you asked a question earlier on about uh, the penetration rate for mobile systems. Um, that is. That is, uh, that's, um, that's exactly the case. If um, in, in, in the developing region whereby the, the, you know, their average income is lower than if you compare it to Singapore or, or, or the US or Hong Kong, um, they are all going to have a headphone. They are not going to have a laptop. And the experience is different. They are not going to look at the news on the laptop. Right? They are going to share the news and communicate with each other. If I'm a farmer, I'm going to be out of the farm. I'm going to rely on this to get weather forecast. So that's very that 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 sort of um, understanding the purpose for them to communicate. Um, we say content, but they want it for a specific purpose. Do they want to know the weather forecast? Do they need to know the price of grain? Is there an earthquake that will affect their you know, shipment? So this is this is how they their world is constructed. And I think there is a very clear opportunity for for Ethereum and, and, and blockchain because if you are able to get those things, the pickup is very fast. And you mentioned influencer, but in different different markets have very different perspectives on influencer marketing, especially right now. Like right now, I would never 
recommend that a company in, an, in the English speaking market explicitly have like an influencer promotion program because I think it would induce a lot of skepticism. But there are markets where I would I would think that was okay. And I would have an English speaking company genuinely go out to people that are important in the market that are very followed and say, do you actually like this thing and will you help me? As opposed to like, here's a well, I think particularly in um, like the brand and e-commerce marketing in China, it's all influencer marketing. Totally. And so it's really, really different yeah. perceptions of that. And it's, it's normal over here. And it's viewed with like a little grain of skepticism over here. Sorry. Um, I, I just have a question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a question on the you know, feedback system for localization. Because, so, I mean, I think, and I, I think everyone else will agree that if you want to build a narrative, consistency is one of the key factors. And but if you have a look, when you are trying to do localization of those narratives, it is very different, very difficult to kind of well, to do to provide QC because you don't know the language. And if you have a, like a kind of a local nationale in your team, it can be provided. But if that's not the case, I was wondering how you kind of make sure that the narrative is localized well and how it is, you know, how you get your getting good feedback. Because I mean, if you have partners, maybe you delegate that. Yeah. But again, you cannot ensure that those partners are doing a good job. So that if you have those suspicions, if you have those doubts, how do you get the feedback and how do you kind of make sure that the narrative is going out consistently? Yeah, so, so a bigger problem outside of that is that Ethereum, no one runs the marketing or PR for Ethereum or can control what the Ethereum narrative is because the community is decentralized. So even if we did have one narrative, like and that to localize, we don't even have that. So we, we have a problem like a layer out from that in terms of like consistency and control. Uh, so so to, and, and then on top of that, you know, one layer in at, at, at the your question layer, sometimes you mess up, you know, like there was a market where we had a partner that we realized pretty quickly, uh, you know, wasn't doing a good job and maybe didn't have a good reputation. We, the moment we found that out, which we found out from, you know, just growing our presence in that market, we switched it, um, and we, you know, very politely we, we switched that up. So, I mean, not not a huge deal, but just like that, this intermediary wasn't doing a great job translating everything, and we wanted to have a better translator. So you you find out from other locals, but that's the way to find out. So you find out from other locals. I, I wish, I wish there, it, it's, it's feedback, and so triangulation is also super important. Triangulating with another disinterested group. So let's say you, you you go into a market, you're translating your content, and it's a market where you don't have anyone on your team, so you've hired some kind of intermediary. You ask someone that they don't know to, to review the thing. I, I wish I could tell you that there was like an algorithm for it, but it's like a manual, <laughs> conceptual kind of process. Yeah, I just asked because globalization can be disastrous in many regions. Oh, it can be. I mean, you need to do that. You need to be rigorous about that because then you, you could be like shot in a certain region without even doing anything wrong. Just because somebody was like, not not literally, just, like have your brand reputation shot, not be like physically shot. <laughs> yes. Uh, <coughs> something to add on to specifically for here, maybe not so much for other projects. Uh, since it's decentralized and no one actually owns it, uh, someone like say the foundation or consensus could uh, this narratives that you want to push out or definitions that you want to have like speak to the layman. Uh, it could be done in a sort of open source way, uh, let's say on GitHub or whatever. And there are local people who are you know interested. So if there is a way where those people can have some sort of reputation check that you know it's not some Nobody trying to push their share their old projects. Uh, then you can reach out to them, and they can sort of translate it or interpret it in their own local context. So that completely exists, and the Ethereum.org website is that. So every so there are translators from all different languages translating all the content on Ethereum.org, which is the site with the domain authority for Ethereum. And so they if you look at the Ethereum.org Twitter, they tweet each time they roll out a new language. And this wonderful woman, Taeyong Kim, who's Korean, who's here, has been running that program. And there are more and more languages. There are now hundreds and hundreds of contributors. And all of it's done through GitHub. So exactly, and yes, 100%. And, that, and it's been really strong, right? Like crowdsourcing translations and then having a professional look it over before it goes out. <coughs> so it's ranking for SEO. And then uh, the other thing that I would definitely recommend getting involved with, because I started it three days ago with, with a with the uh, bigger people was um, is marketing down. So the idea 
is to if we, we we launched it at the um, at the uh, Mollendown meetup, and the idea is to get a bunch of stakeholders in the space together to create the funding and governance mechanism for properly marketing and messaging the area. Um, because you know there should be some independent entity that does that that has the proper expertise to do it. So there's a Telegram channel. There's going to be a Twitter. Um, looking for members and looking for members that can help work on it and probably it'll end up being paid opportunities for people because there'll be funding going to it. Knock on, knock on this. That's awesome. That, that's funny. I'm trying to start a new staff. We'll call it Dow Desk. No. Are you? <laughs> are you? Are you? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to tweet it into existence. I'll go tweet it. <laughs> if it's Twitter, it's true. Yeah. yeah. But I had a question. So. As uh, you know, you guys are kind of meme hustlers, right? Narrative peddlers. What are the hot <laughs> narratives that you're selling today? What, what what's what's hot in Asia? What's hot in Asia? Yeah. Um, I would say it's not actually defined yet, but it's uh, it's still gonna. The lady who just left, she did mention that a lot of the top process still originates from what we call U.S. Cobra, uh, which is it, it it is the case. Uh, Asia is still very focused on enterprise. Like they are, it's extremely focused on enterprise. So um, I, uh, the business side of things, you know, when 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 uh, I don't represent the business business role, but um, that business side of thing is about how do we get something created. So the conversation has shifted from what is blockchain, how does this work to POC. It's way past POC. Now businesses don't need you to explain. They don't need us to explain what is blockchain. What is it? What is this magical thing? How the question is H O W how how will you make this work and they tend to already have a certain um, idea that they want that the top process has already been digested internally. If I'm a business in a certain sector, I want something a certain way. Can you create this for me? Will you roll this out for me? That is the conversation at the business level now. It's beyond P O C. It's already beyond P O C. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think maybe we went over this before you came in, but. I think the stories that people really want to tell right now are stories with real numbers in them. So either it's an enterprise spending real money or making real money, um, or it's something with major funding, or it's something with major uh, customers. So if there's a number, uh, people like that right now. Um, then DeFi, people are trying to figure out what it is, trying to follow it, Ethereum 2.0 and roadmap, um, scaling. Um, I think those are probably Things people are looking for right now. I think some people are interested in this next round of ID, the next IEO thing. If there is another thing that looks kind of like ICOs but is located somewhere different. Given the enterprise thirst, do you work with people like EY and Nightfall to push that into the enterprise space in Asia, or is that too partner specific at your level? I don't have the information specific. It's something I I, I should check because. Uh, we have, because I'm not a developer background myself, so I, that, that may be conversations about this that I'm not familiar with, yet, so I can't quite answer that. But this is specific to EY's Nightfall, right? Yeah, yeah, it just seems like they're doing really great things on the enterprise to make use and publish that, or have those enterprise users interact with the public chain. Yeah. I think um, there's very close connectivity I'm between sure, the yeah. team there. Yeah, okay. Consensus and the Ethereum space. They were speaking on the, I saw them yesterday. They were yeah, yesterday, yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're part of our, they're part of our whole jam, for sure. I like the name. Yeah, I know. I know, it's like, oh, I wish I had that. Okay, are we done for time? A a any? Sorry, we're getting some kind of time message from the yeah. back. What is that time message that you're giving us? It looks like a string of matrix numbers. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I guess we're just not going to do that exercise. Nobody seems no. to really want to. Um, Unless someone other... wants to pitch the idea. To so <laughs> coin this. <laughs> Who's sitting right there? The embodiment of coin this. No, you're, you're, you're now the embodiment of Dow. The Dow Desk. New Dow Desk. New Dow Desk. Maybe you guys can introduce a bit more about marketing Dow and Dow Desk and how we can. Well, June, do you want to you pitch uh, Dow Desk? Sure. So my, the argument goes like this, right? Um, if news is a commons and a public good, then who should fund that public good? And, the, uh, and the, the answer is the people who are affected by the news. So if we want to create a new source to cover cryptocurrency, then we could imagine you know, 
the top 10 public chains, uh, the top 10 exchanges, the biggest wallets, the biggest VCs, they should all be members of this DAO. They should put funds to the DAO so that the DAO can uh, allocate the resource to create news gathering teams to cover this audience. Um, and if you want to make it a revenue generating DAO, then that DAO could own some assets, like let's call it DAODesk.com. Uh, and DAODesk.com is a place that the, the news that's approved by the DAO gets published, and it's a place that advertising and other revenue generating things can be attached to it and can be fed back into the DAO. Um, Sounds like we should definitely work together with Marketing DAO and DAO Desk. Marketing DAO could market DAO Desk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, DAO Desk could be like the PR, the, the, the like right. publication outlet of Marketing DAO. Yes. DAO like, Desk is registered. Oh, I'm not by him. I, oh, no, 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 I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Sam just did it right now. What is going on? Sam just spotted on your domain, Jim. Spotting, man. Just selling it to you. Classic spell desk with a Q. You have a Q. Okay, let's try. Q, down, down, desk. Sam is squatting on every possible iteration. It's available. It's available. Any more questions from even other regions or something? Something you guys want to do in Asia? Roadblocks? I'm just more of an enthusiast here, so I spend a lot of my time reading a lot of the publications from this here. From where I sit, I still feel like people use the word Bitcoin to represent blockchain. Or they, there's a great article that comes out on news of Ethereum, and it's like they've gone through the article and removed the word Ethereum and put the word blockchain into it. Do you know why from this presentation? Well, they're trying to appeal to a larger mass of people. So yeah, it's SEO. Right? It's, it's like, it, it, it's a calculated decision. Um, it, it's infuriating from my point of view. You just <laughs> so so I, was, I was at Huffington Post um, in like 2013, and one thing that we would do is we would just put like Kim Kardashian into the base name of the URL for nearly everything. So you would go to, you would go to like any like news article, and there would be all this stuff in the base name of the URL that just was stuff, right? Like keywords. And so it's not like something malicious that the media has against Ethereum. They're just going to go with what's the most recognized because it's like they're going to cover like a zebra walking down Fifth Avenue. They're not going to cover a zebra in the zoo. And they're not going to cover, you know, something that's small, something that's not important, something that doesn't stand out. And Bitcoin makes it stand out more because it's better known. We went over those numbers with the 75% versus the 17%. And so the way to fix that is to get Ethereum more known. Um, and the more known Ethereum is, the more likely media is to put it in a headline. There's a really funny Twitter account, though, called Built on, Built on ETH, which tweets out every article that is about something that's built on Ethereum that doesn't mention that it's Oh, there is. Ethereum. And it's really funny. They do a good job. They do a really good job. And the other thing is, one trend I've noticed with crypto and blockchain startups, and I can't decide whether this is good or bad, they don't mention that they're on blockchain at all. But, and they're, they're mostly on Ethereum. Like, the last time I checked, something like, 96% of projects built on Ethereum, built on blockchain, or built on Ethereum. When people say blockchain, they usually mean Ethereum. But you know, blockchain is a much bigger key, keyword than Ethereum still, and Bitcoin is a bigger keyword than blockchain. Um, and lots of companies don't even want it to be associated with cryptocurrency um, because of the recalibration. So um, it, that, that's where we are right now, and there needs to be applications of Ethereum Build up the name recognition. There needs there needs to be a meme for so so Bitcoin. So here's a challenge. Bitcoin is digital gold, store of value. There are, there are all these memes about Bitcoin, um, and Ethereum doesn't really have a meme right now. And so there's a there's a zillion dollar competition going on, or um, an infinite an infinitely scalably uh, remunerative competition for who can figure out a, a meme for Ethereum. Because programmable money doesn't really cover it. Smart contract platform, like nobody's looking for that, not yet. Um, you know. What were we talked about last night, the biggest blockchain actually gets the word yeah, blockchain. Yeah, last, last night we were talking about calling it the biggest blockchain. Actually, and, then, and then there would be a sister company called the bestest blockchain. The bestest. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I like the biggest blockchain. Yeah, I think that's not, that's not uh, old yet, I think. 
So there, there's a great there's a great um, book called The Twenty Two Immutable Laws of Marketing, and basically you can only you can only like, think about one thing occupying one hyperbole. So you have like a little like a space like a bubbling out in your mind for each hyperbole, and you only get one one you get to lodge one thing there. So like the safest car is Volvo, you know, and no one else can be the safest car. You have to be the something else's car. You have to be the flashiest car. You have to be the loudest car. You have to be the I don't really like cars, so it's all negative. Um, but uh, you know, like it, you have to, you have to be the something, and uh, Ethereum's still working on that. And gosh, should I try in my capacity of consensus to uh, to make that? And uh, it's not made yet, so let's work on it. The cutest blockchain. That's Doge. That's Doge. You see exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. That's, exactly. See, that's, that's actually immediate. When I say cutest Doge, which is true, there's so many pictures. <laughs> I think we have, we have Three minutes left. Who are the personalities in Ethereum who you guys have found to be the most marketable? Is it marketable? Like, for Vitalik, example, so Vitalik. Is it Vitalik? Is so it it's interesting. Vitalik? People people think that Joe is more, and this is just talking about them as like per, like objects. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't. This doesn't include like the warmth of their personality or like whether they're like good people or what they eat for breakfast, but just looking at them as names. Vitalik is a zebra walking down Fifth Avenue um, because of his age. It's very unusual to have someone that young creating something this impactful. And so, and also being so articulate in many of the ways that he's so articulate. So that's why that was listed as one of the core stories from the very beginning because, um, because of that persona. Whereas you get someone with someone like Joe's background more often in that kind of position. Um, that doesn't lessen his ability as a storyteller in the space, but it's certainly like a less unusual uh, profile. And that's better for certain situations and worse for other situations. So what I like is that there's actually such a variety of characters in the space that, that sub into the situations that make the most sense. Um, I think, I mean, the two of them are the ones that I think of the most along with, with Ethereum. Um, is, is that, does that, resonate with you, or is that just me living in my world of consensus pure? Maybe, um, I don't know, but to hear from the junior so I, I guess for Asia specifically to, okay, um, for like Singapore, Vitalik, um, definitely Joe, yes. For Joe is a bit specific, they tend to look at him from the, because Singapore is such a financial hub, they look at it from the financial hub, and it ties back to Vitalik. Uh, yeah, yeah. For Vitalik, uh, I, I mentioned earlier in, in, in the deck, um, he's, he's, he's big in uh, the Chinese speaking via Taiwan, China by association, so we have China sort of covering. Um, Hong Kong, I haven't got a grasp where his sort of um, place is in, I guess, but Taiwan, Hong Kong, that sort of thing, that's covered. Is there anyone that, that you think of as being like secret heroes? Like a, like a super, like, you know, and then, then there, there, are a bunch of, there are a bunch of kind of people that technical people know, like, like Carl Flores, Danny Bryan, and then I would say that people know I am. Um, I think people on the enter. I think we've got some folks here that, that when you go to the enterprise side of this are like the main, the main, the main folks. Like your, it's like a, it's a pantheon of different, different um, uh, deities for different occasions. Well, I also think that um, we as developers get stuck in marketing to this tiny little ecosystem, right? And if we're going to actually get this story to be a bigger story, we have to find the means that actually the work. Biggest the story. Yes. biggest story. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's something that we hear a lot. So, developers are not necessarily businessmen. Businessmen are not necessarily developers. The language is quite different. Quite different. Anyway, how are we? We're out of time. That comes to us. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you.